Section 7 of The Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 7. Young Adam Cupid. No one would have suspected Edward of being in love, but that after breakfast, with an overacted carelessness, "'Anybody who likes,' he said, "'can feed my rabbits,' and he disappeared, with a jauntiness that deceived nobody in the direction of the orchard. Now kingdoms might totter and reel, and convulsions change the map of Europe, but the iron, unwritten law prevailed that each boy severely fed his own rabbits.' There was good ground, then, for suspicion and alarm, and while the lettuce-leaves were being drawn through the wires, Harold and I conferred seriously on the situation. It may be thought that the affair was none of our business, and indeed we cared little as individuals. We were only concerned as members of a corporation, for each of whom the mental or physical ailment of one of his fellows might have far-reaching effects. It was thought best that Harold, at least open to suspicion of motive, should be dispatched to probe and peer. His instructions were to proceed by a report on the health of our rabbits in particular, to glide gently into a discussion on rabbits in general, their customs, practices, and vices, to pass thence by a natural transition to the female sex, the inherent flaws in its composition, and the reasons for regarding it, speaking broadly, as dirt. He was especially to be diplomatic, and then to return and report progress. He departed on his mission gaily, but his absence was short, and his return, discomfited and in tears, seemed to betoken some want of parts for diplomacy. He had found Edward, it appeared, pacing the orchard, with the sort of set smile that mountebanks wear in their precarious antics, fixed painfully on his face, as with pins. Harold had opened well on the rabbit subject, but, with a fatal confusion, between the abstract and the concrete, had then gone on to remark that Edward's lop-eared doe, with her long hind legs and contemptuous twitch of the nose, always reminded him of Sabina Larkin, a nine-year-old damsel, child of a neighbouring farmer. At which point Edward, it would seem, had turned upon and savagely maltreated him, twisting his arm and punching him in the short ribs so that Harold returned to the rabbit-hutches preceded by long-drawn wails, anon wishing with sobs that he were a man to kick his lovelorn brother, anon lamenting that ever he had been born. I was not big enough to stand up to Edward personally, so I had to console the sufferer by allowing him to grease the wheels of the donkey-cart, a luscious treat that had been specially reserved for me a week past by the gardener's boy, for putting in a good word on his behalf with the new kitchen-maid. Harold was soon all smiles and grease, and I was not, on the whole, dissatisfied with the significant hint that had been gained as to the fawns at Ergo Mali. Fortunately, means were at hand for resolving any doubts on the subject, since the morning was Sunday, and already the bells were ringing for church. Lest the connection may not be evident at first sight, I should explain that the gloomy period of church time, with its enforced inaction and its lack of real interest, passed too within sight of all that the village held of fairest, was just the one when a young man's fancies lightly turned to thoughts of love. For such trifling the rest of the week afforded no leisure, but in church, well, there was really nothing else to do. True, knots and crosses, might be indulged in on fly-leaves of prayer-books while the litany dragged its slow length along. But what balm or what solace could be found for the sermon? Naturally the eye, wandering here and there, among the serried lengths, made bold, untrammeled choice among fair fellow-supplicants. It was in this way that, some months earlier, under the exceptional strain of the Athanian creed, my roving fancy had settled upon the baker's wife as a fit object for a lifelong devotion. Her riper charms had conquered a heart which none of her bemusland, tintering juniors had been able to subdue, and that she was already wedded had never occurred to me as any bar to my affection. Edward's general demeanour, then, during the morning service was safe to convict him, but there was also a special test for the particular case. 
It happened that we sat in a transept, and, the larkings being behind us, Edward's only chance of feasting on Sabina's charms was in the all-too-fleeting interval, when we swung round eastwards. I was not mistaken. During the singing of the Benedictus, the impatient one made several false starts, and at last he slewed fairly round before, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, was half finished. The evidence was conclusive. A court of law could have desired no better. The fact being patent, the next thing was to grapple with it, and my mind was fully occupied during the sermon. There was really nothing unfair or unbrotherly in my attitude. A philosophic affection, such as my own, which clashed with nothing, was, I held, permissible. But the volcanic passions in which Edward indulged about once a quarter were serious interference with business. To make matters worse, next week there was a circus coming to the neighbourhood, to which we had all been strictly forbidden to go, and without Edward no visit in contempt of law and orders could be successfully brought off. I had sounded him as to the circus on our way to church, and he had replied briefly that the very thought of a clown made him sick. Morbidity could no further go. But the sermon came to an end without any line of conduct having suggested itself, and I walked home in some depression, feeling sadly that Venus was in the ascendant and in dire opposition, while Ariga, the circus star, drooped declinant perilously near the horizon. By the irony of fate, Aunt Eliza, of all people, turned out to be the Dea ex machina, which thing fell out in this wise. It was that lady's obnoxious practice to issue forth of a Sunday afternoon, and on a visit of state to such farmers and cottagers as dwelt at hand, on which occasion she was wont to hail a reluctant boy along with her, from the fixed motives of propriety and his soul's health. Much cudgelling of brains, I suppose, had on that particular day made me torbid and unwary. Anyhow, when a victim came to be sought for, I fell an easy prey, while the others fled scatheless and whooping. Our first visit was to the Larkings. Here ceremonial might be viewed in its finest flower, and we conducted ourselves like Queen Elizabeth when she trod the measure, high and disposedly. In the low, oak-panelled parlour, cake and currant wine were set forth, and after courtesies and compliments exchanged, Aunt Eliza, greatly condescending, talked the fashions with Mrs. Larking, while the farmer and I, perspiring with the usual effort, exchanged remarks on the mutability of the weather and the steady fall in the price of corn. Who would have thought to hear us that only two short days ago we had confronted each other on either side of a hedge? I, triumphant, provocative, derisive, he flushed, wroth, cracking his whip and volleying forth profanity. So powerful is all subduing ceremony. Sabina the while, demurely seated with a pilgrim's progress on her knee, and apparently absorbed in a brightly coloured presentiment of Apollyon straddling right across the way, eyed me at times with shy interest, but repelled all Aunt Eliza's advances with a frigid politeness for which I could not sufficiently admire her. "'It's surprising to me,' I heard my aunt remark presently, "'how my eldest nephew, Edward, despises little girls. "'I heard him tell Charlotte the other day "'that he wished he could exchange her "'for a pair of Japanese guinea-pigs. "'It made the poor child cry. "'Boys are so heartless.' "'I saw Sabina stiffen as she sat, "'and her tip-tilted nose twitched scornfully. "'Now this boy here,' my soul descended into my very boots, could the woman have intercepted any of my amorous glances at the baker's wife? Now this boy, my aunt went on, is more human altogether. Only yesterday he took his sister to the baker's shop, and spent his only penny buying her sweets. I thought it showed such a nice disposition. I wish Edward were more like him. I breathed again. It was unnecessary to explain my real motives for that visit to the baker's. Sabina's face softened, and her contemptuous nose descended from its altitude of scorn. She gave me one shy glance of kindness, and then concentrated her attention upon mercy knocking at the wicket gate. I felt awfully mean as regarded Edward, but what could I do? I was in Gaza, gagged and bound. The Philistines hemmed me in. The same evening the storm burst, the bolt fell, and, to continue the metaphor, 
the atmosphere grew serene and clear once more. The evening service was shorter than usual, the vicar, as he ascended the pulpit steps, having dropped two pages out of his sermon case, unperceived by any but ourselves, either at the moment or subsequently when the hiatus was reached. So, as we joyfully shuffled out, I whispered Edward that by racing home at top speed we should make time to assume our bows and arrows, laid aside for the day, and play at Indians and buffaloes with Aunt Eliza's fowls, already strolling roostwards, regardless of their doom, before that sedately stepping lady could return. Edward hung at the door, wavering. The suggestion had unhallowed charms. At that moment Sabina issued primly forth and, seeing Edward, put out her tongue at him in the most exasperating manner conceivable, then passed on her way, her shoulders rigid, her dainty head held high. A man can stand very much in the cause of love, poverty, ants, rivals, barriers of every sort. All these only serve to fan the flame, but personal ridicule is a shaft that reaches the very vitals. Edward led the race home at a speed which one of Ballantyne's heroes must have equalled, but never surpassed. And that evening the Indians dispersed Aunt Eliza's fowls over several square miles of country, so that the tale of them remaineth incomplete to this day. Edward himself, cheering wildly, pursued the big cock in china cock, till the bird sank, gasping under the drawing-room window, whereat its mistress stood petrified, and after supper, in the shrubbery, smoked a half-consumed cigar he had picked up in the road, and declared to an awe-stricken audience his final, his immitigable resolve to go into the army. The crisis was passed, and Edward was saved. And yet, sunt lash or may, remen. To me, watching the cigar-stump alternately pale and glow against the dark background of laurel, a vision of a tip-tilted nose, of a small head, poised scornfully, seemed to hover on the gathering gloom, seemed to grow and fade and grow again, like the grin of the Cheshire cat. Pathetically, reproachfully even, and the charms of the baker's wife slipped from my memory like snow wreaths in thaw. After all, Sabina was no wise to blame. Why should the child be punished? Tomorrow I would give them the slip, and stroll round by her garden, promiscuous-like, at a time when the farmer was safe in the rickyard. If nothing came of it, there was no harm done, and if on the contrary. End of section 7、section、eight of the Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section eight. The Burglars. It was much too fine a night to think of going to bed at once, and so, although the witching hour of nine p.m. had struck, Edward and I were still leaning out of the open window in our night shirts, watching the play of cedar branch shadows on the moonlit lawn, and planning schemes of fresh devilry for the sunshiny morrow. From below, strains of the jocund piano declared that the Olympians were enjoying themselves in their listless, impotent way, for the new curate had been bidden to dinner that night, and was at the moment unclerically proclaiming to all the world that he feared no foe. His discordant vociferations doubtless started a train of thought in Edward's mind, for the youth presently remarked, apropos of nothing that had been said before, I believe the new curate's rather gone on Aunt Maria. I scouted the notion. Why, she's quite old, I said. She must have been some five and twenty summers. Of course she is, replied Edward scornfully. It's not her, it's her money he's after, you bet. I didn't know she had any money, I observed timidly. Sure to have, said my brother with confidence. Heaps and heaps. Silence ensued, both our minds being busy with the new situation thus presented. Mine, in wonderment at this flaw that so often declared itself in enviable natures of fullest endowment, in a grown up man and a good cricketer, for instance, 
even as this curate. Edwards, apparently, in the consideration of how such a state of things, supposing it existed, could be best turned to his own advantage. "'Bobby Ferris told me,' began Edward in due chorus, "'that there was a fellow spooning his sister once.' "'What's spooning?' I asked meekly. "'Oh, I don't know,' said Edward indifferently. "'It's—it's—it's it's, it's just a thing they do, you know. "'And he used to carry notes and messages and things between them, "'and he got a shilling almost every time. "'What, from each of them?' I innocently inquired. "'Edward looked at me with scornful pity. "'Girls never have any money,' he briefly explained. "'But she did his exercises, and got him out of rows, "'and told stories for him when he needed it, "'and much better ones than he could have made up for himself. "'Girls are useful in some ways. "'So he was living in Clover, "'when unfortunately they went and quarrelled about something. "'I don't see what that's got to do with it,' I said. "'Nor don't I,' rejoined Edward. "'But anyhow the notes and things stopped, and so did the shillings. "'Bobby was fairly cornered, for he'd bought two ferrets on tick, "'and promised to pay a shilling a week, "'thinking the shillings were going on forever, silly young ass. "'So when the week was up, and he was being dunned for the shilling, "'he went off to the fellow and said, "'Your broken-hearted Bella implores you to meet her at sundown "'by the hollow oak, as of old, be it only for a moment. "'Do not fail.' "'He got all that out of some rotten book, of course.' The fellow looked puzzled and said, "'What hollow oak? I don't know any hollow oak.' "'Perhaps it was the royal oak,' said Bobby promptly, "'cause he saw he had made a slip through trusting too much to the rotten book. "'But this didn't seem to make the fellow any happier.' "'I should think not,' I said. "'The royal oak's an awful low sort of pub.' "'I know,' said Edward. "'Well, at last the fellow said, "'I think I know what she means.' THE HOLLOW TREE IN YOUR FATHER'S PADDOCK. IT HAPPENS TO BE AN ELM, BUT SHE WOULDN'T KNOW THE DIFFERENCE. ALL RIGHT, SAY I'LL BE THERE. BOBBY HUNG ABOUT A BIT, FOR HE HADN'T GOT HIS MONEY. SHE WAS CRYING AWFULLY, HE SAID. THEN HE GOT HIS SHILLING. AND WASN'T THE FELLOW RILED? I INQUIRED. WHEN HE GOT TO THE PLACE AND FOUND NOTHING? HE FOUND BOBBY, SAID EDWARD INDIGNANTLY. YOUNG FERRIS WAS GENTLEMAN EVERY INCH OF HIM. He brought the fellow another message from Bella. I dare not leave the house. My cruel parents immure me closely. If only you knew what I suffer. Your broken-hearted Bella. Out of the same rotten book. This made the fellow a little suspicious, because it was the old Ferris's who had been keen about the thing all through. The fellow, you see, had tin. But what's that got to— I began again. Oh, I don't know, said Edward impatiently. I'm telling you just what Bobby told me. He got suspicious anyhow, but he couldn't exactly call Bella's brother a liar, so Bobby escaped for the time. But when he was in a hole next week, over a stiff French exercise, he tried the same sort of game on his sister. She was too sharp for him, and he got caught out. Somehow women seem more mistrustful than men. They're so beastly suspicious by nature, you know. I know, said I. But did the two— the fellow and the sister make it up afterwards? I don't remember about that, replied Edward indifferently. But Bobby got packed off to school a whole year earlier than his people meant to send him, which was just what he wanted. So you see it all came right in the end. I was trying to puzzle out the moral of this story. It was evidently meant to contain one somewhere, when a flood of golden lamplight mingled with the moon rays on the lawn and Aunt Maria and the new curate strolled out on the grass below us, and took the direction of a garden seat that was backed by a dense laurel shrubbery, reaching round in a half-circle to the house. Edward meditated moodily. "'If we only knew what they were talking about,' said he, "'you'd soon see whether I was right or not. Look here, let's send the kid down by the porch to reconnoitre.' "'Harold's asleep,' I said. "'It seems rather a shame.' "'Oh, rot,' said my brother. "'He's the youngest, and he's got to do as he's told.' So the luckless Harold was hauled out of bed and given his sailing orders. He was naturally rather vexed at being stood up suddenly on the cold floor, and the job had no particular interest for him. But he was both staunch and well-disciplined. The means of exit were simple enough. 
a porch of iron trellis came up to within easy reach of the window, and was habitually used by all three of us, when modestly anxious to avoid public notice. Harold climbed deftly down the porch like a white rat, and his nightgown glimmered a moment on the gravel walk ere he was lost to sight in the darkness of the shrubbery. A brief interval of silence ensued, broken suddenly by a sound of scuffle, and then a shrill, long-drawn squeal, as of metallic surfaces in friction. Our scout had fallen into the hands of the enemy. Indolence alone had made us devolve the task of investigation on our younger brother. Now that danger had declared itself, there was no hesitation. In a second we were down the side of the porch and crawling Cherokee-wise through the laurels to the back of the garden seat. Piteous was the sight that greeted us. Aunt Maria was on the seat, in a white evening frock, looking, for an aunt, really quite nice. On the lawn stood an incensed curate, grasping our small brother by a large ear, which, judging from the row he was making, seemed on the point of parting company with the head it adorned. The gruesome noise he was emitting did not really affect us otherwise than aesthetically. To one who has tried both, the wail of genuine physical anguish is easy distinguishable from the pumped-up ad misericordiam blubber. Harold's could clearly be recognized as belonging to the latter class. "'Now, you young—whelp, I think it was, but Edward stoutly maintains it was devil,' said the curate sternly. "'Tell us what it is you meant by it.' "'Well, let go of my ear, then,' shrilled Harold, "'and I'll tell you the solemn truth.' "'Very well,' agreed the curate, releasing him. "'Now go ahead, and don't lie more than you can help. We abode the promised disclosure without the least misgiving, but even we had hardly given Harold due credit for his fertility of resource and powers of imagination. I had just finished saying my prayers, began that young gentleman slowly, when I happened to look out of the window, and on the lawn I saw a sight which froze the marrow in my veins. A burglar was approaching the house with snake-like tread. He had a scowl and a dark lantern, and he was armed to the teeth. We listened with interest. The style, though unlike Harold's narrative notes, seemed strangely familiar. "'Go on,' said the curate grimly. Pausing in his stealthy career, continued Harold, he gave a low whistle. Instantly the signal was responded to, and from the adjacent shadows— Two more figures glided forth. The miscreants were both armed to the teeth. Excellent, said the curate. Proceed. The robber chief, pursued Harold, warming to his work, joined his nefarious comrades and conversed with them in silent tones. His expression was truly ferocious, and I ought to have said that he was armed to the t— There, never mind his teeth, interrupted the curate rudely. There's too much jaw about you altogether. Hurry up and have done. I was in a frightful funk, continued the narrator, warily guarding his ear with his hand. But just then the drawing-room window opened, and you and Aunt Maria came out, I mean, emerged. The burglars vanished silently into the laurels, with horrid implications. The curate looked slightly puzzled. The tale was well sustained and certainly circumstantial. After all, the boy might have really seen something. How was the poor man to know, though the chaste and lofty diction might have supplied a hint, that the whole yarn was a free adaptation from the last penny dreadful lent us by the knife and boot boy? "'Why did you not alarm the house?' he asked. "'Cause I was afraid,' said Harold sweetly, "'that perhaps they mightn't believe me.' "'But how did you get down here, you naughty little boy?' put in Aunt Maria. Harold was hard-pressed, by his own flesh and blood, too. At that moment Edward touched me on the shoulder and glided off through the laurels. When some ten yards away he gave a low whistle, I replied by another. The effect was magical. Aunt Maria started up with a shriek. Harold gave one startled glance around— and then fled like a hare, 
made straight for the back door, burst in upon the servants at supper, and buried himself in the broad bosom of the cook, his special ally. The curate faced the laurels hesitatingly, but Aunt Maria flung herself on him. "'Oh, Mr. Hodgetts!' I heard her cry. "'You are brave. For my sake, do not be rash!' He was not rash. When I peeped out a second later, the coast was entirely clear. By this time there were sounds of a household timidly emerging, and Edward remarked to me that perhaps we had better be off. Retreat was an easy matter. A stunted laurel gave a leg up on to the garden wall, which led in its turn to the roof of an outhouse, up which, at a dubious angle, we could crawl to the window of the box-room. This overland route had been revealed to us one day by the domestic cat, when hard-pressed in the course of an otter-hunt, in which the cat, somewhat unwillingly, was fulfilling the title role. It had proved distinctly useful on occasions like the present. We were snug in bed, minus some cuticle from knees and elbows, and Harold, sleepily chewing something sticky, had been carried up in the arms of the friendly cook ere the clamour of the burglar-hunters had died away. The curate's undaunted demeanour, as reported by Aunt Maria, was generally supposed to have terrified the burglars into flight, and much kudos accrued to him thereby. Some days later, however, when he had dropped into afternoon tea, and was making a mild curatorial joke about the moral courage required for taking the last piece of bread and butter, I felt constrained to remark dreamily, and as it were to the universe at large, "'Mr. Hodgetts, you are brave. For my sake, do not be rash.' Fortunately for me, the vicar was also a caller on that day, and it was always a comparatively easy matter to dodge my long-coated friend in the open. End of Section 8 The Golden Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Eastman, October 2007. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 9. A Harvesting. The year was in its yellowing time, and the face of nature a study in old gold. A field, or semé, with garbs of the same. It may be false heraldry, nature's generally is, but it correctly blazons the display that Edward and I considered from the rickyard gate. Harold was not on in this scene, being stretched upon the couch of pain. The special disorder, stomach-ache, as usual. The evening before, Edward, in a fit of unwanted amiability, had deigned to carve me out a turnip lantern, an art and craft he was peculiarly deft in, and Harold, as the interior of the turnip flew out in scented fragments under the hollowing knife, had eaten largely thereof, regarding all such jetsam as his special perquisite. Now he was dreeing his weird with such assistance as the chemist could afford. But Edward and I, knowing that this particular field was to be carried to-day, were reveling in the privilege of riding in the empty wagons from the rickyard back to the sheaves, whence we returned toilfully on foot to career it again over the billowy acres in these great galleys of a stubble sea. It was the nearest approach to sailing that we inland urchins might compass, and hence it ensued that such stirring scenes as Sir Richard Grenville on the Revenge, the smoke-wreathed battle of the Nile, and the death of Nelson, had all been enacted in turn on these dusty quarter-decks as they swayed and bumped a field. Another wagon had shot its load, and was jolting out through the rickyard gate, as we swung ourselves in, shouting over its tail. Edward was the first up, and, as I gained my feet, he clutched me in a death-grapple. I was a privateersman, he proclaimed, and he the captain of the British frigate Terpsichore, of, I forget the precise number of guns. 
Edward always collared the best parts to himself. But I was holding my own gallantly, when I suddenly discovered that the floor we battled on was swarming with earwigs. Shrieking, I hurled free of him, and rolled over the tailboard onto the stubble. Edward executed a war-dance of triumph on the deck of the retreating galleon, but I cared little for that. I knew he knew that I wasn't afraid of him, but that I was, and terribly, of earwigs, those mortal bugs of the field. So I let him disappear, shouting lustily for all hands to repel boarders, while I strolled inland down the village. There was a touch of adventure in the expedition. This was not our own village, but a foreign one, distant at least a mile. One felt that sense of mingled distinction and insecurity which is familiar to the traveller. Distinction, in that folk turned the head to note you curiously, insecurity by reason of the ever-present possibility of missiles on the part of the more juvenile inhabitants, a class eternally conservative. Elated with isolation, I went even more nose in air than usual, and, even so, I mused, might Mungo Park have threaded the trackless African forest, and here I plumped against a soft but resisting body. Recalled to my senses by the shock, I fell back in the attitude every boy under these circumstances instinctively adopts, both elbows well up over the ears. I found myself facing a tall elderly man, clean-shaven, clad in well-worn black, a clergyman, evidently, and I noted at once a far-away look in his eyes, as if they were used to another plane of vision, and could not instantly focus things terrestrial, being suddenly recalled thereto. His figure was bent in apologetic protest. "'I ask a thousand pardons, sir,' he said. "'I am really so very absent-minded. I trust you will forgive me.' Now, most boys would have suspected chaff under this courtly style of address. I take infinite credit to myself for recognizing at once the natural attitude of a man to whom his fellows were gentlemen all, neither Jew nor Gentile, clean nor unclean. Of course I took the blame on myself, adding that I was very absent-minded too, which was indeed the case. I perceive, he said pleasantly, that we have something in common. I, an old man, dream dreams, you, a young one, see visions. Your lot is the happier. And now? His hand had been resting all this time on a wicket-gate. You are hot, it is easily seen. The day is advanced. Virgo is a zodiacal sign. Perhaps I may offer you some poor refreshment, if your engagements will permit." My only engagement that afternoon was an arithmetic lesson, and I had not intended to keep it in any case, so I passed in, while he held the gate open politely, murmuring, Venit Hesperus ite capelle, come, little kid. And then, apologizing abjectly for a familiarity which, he said, was less his than the Roman poet's. A straight flagged walk led up to the cool-looking old house, and my host, lingering in his progress at this rose-tree and that, forgot all about me at least twice, waking up and apologizing humbly after each lapse. During these intervals I put two and two together, and identified him as the rector, a bachelor, eccentric, learned exceedingly, round whom the crust of legend was already beginning to form, to myself an object of special awe, in that he was alleged to have written a real book. Heaps of books, Martha, my informant, said, but I knew the exact rate of discount applicable to Martha's statements. We passed eventually through a dark hall into a room which struck me at once as the ideal I had dreamed but failed to find. 
none of your feminine fripperies here, none of your chairbacks and tidies. This man, it was seen, groaned under no aunts. Stout volumes in calf and vellum lined three sides. Books sprawled or hunched themselves on chairs and tables. Books diffused the pleasant odor of printer's ink and bindings. Topping all, a faint aroma of tobacco cheered and heartened exceedingly, as under foreign skies the flap and rustle over the wayfarer's head of the Union Jack, the old flag of emancipation. And in one corner, book-piled like the rest of the furniture, stood a piano. This I hailed with a squeal of delight. "'Want to strum?' inquired my friend, as if it was the most natural wish in the world. His eyes were already straying towards another corner, where bits of writing-table peeped out from under a sort of alpine system of book and foolscap. "'Oh, but may I?' I asked in doubt. "'At home I'm not allowed to. Only beastly exercises.' "'Well, you can strum here, at all events,' he replied, and murmuring absently, Age, dic latinum, barbite, carmen. He made his way, mechanically guided, as it seemed, to the irresistible writing-table. In ten seconds he was out of sight and call. A great book open on his knee, another propped up in front, a score or so disposed within easy reach, he read and jotted with an absorption almost passionate. I might have been in Boeotia, for any consciousness he had of me. So, with a light heart, I turned to and strummed. Those who painfully and with bleeding feet have scaled the crags of mastery over musical instruments have yet their loss in this, that the wild joy of strumming has become a vanished sense. Their happiness comes from the concord and the relative value of the notes they handle, the pure, absolute quality and nature of each note in itself are only appreciated by the strummer. For some notes have all the sea in them, and some cathedral bells, others a woodland joyance and a smell of greenery. In some, fawns dance to the merry reed, and even the grave centaurs peep out from their caves. Some bring moonlight, and some the deep crimson of a rose's heart. Some are blue, some red, while others will tell of an army with silken standards and march music. And throughout all the sequence of suggestion, up above, the little white men leap and peep and strive against the imprisoning wires, and all the big rosewood box hums as it were full of hiving bees. Spent with the rapture, I paused a moment and caught my friend's eye over the edge of a folio. "'But as for these Germans,' he began abruptly, as if we had been in the middle of a discussion, "'the scholarship is there, I grant you, but the spark, the fine perception, the happy intuition, where is it? They get it all from us.' "'They get nothing whatever from us.' I said decidedly, the word German only suggesting bands, to which Aunt Eliza was bitterly hostile. "'You think not?' he rejoined doubtfully, getting up and walking about the room. "'Well, I applaud such fairness and temperance in so young a critic. They are qualities, in youth, as rare as they are pleasing. But just look at Schrumpfius, for instance, how he struggles and wrestles with a simple gar in this very passage here. I peeped fearfully through the open door, half dreading to see some sinuous and snark-like conflict in progress on the mat. But all was still. I saw no trouble at all in the passage, and I said so. Precisely, he cried, delighted, to you, who possess the natural scholar's faculty in so happy a degree, there is no difficulty at all. But to this shrumpfious... But here, luckily for me, in came the housekeeper, a clean-looking woman of staid aspect. Your tea is in the garden, 
she said, as if she were correcting a faulty emendation. I've put some cakes and things for the little gentleman, and you'd better drink it before it gets cold. He waved her off, and continued his stride, brandishing an aorist over my devoted head. The housekeeper waited unmoved till there fell a moment's break in his descant, and then, "'You'd better drink it before it gets cold,' she observed again impassively. The wretched man cast a deprecating look at me. "'Perhaps a little tea would be rather nice,' he observed feebly, and to my great relief he led the way into the garden. I looked about for the little gentleman— but, failing to discover him, I concluded he was absent-minded too, and attacked the cakes and things with no misgivings. After a most successful and most learned tea, a something happened which, small as I was, never quite shook itself out of my memory. To us at Parley, in an arbor over the high road, there entered, slouching into view, a dingy tramp, satellited by a frowsy woman and a pariah dog, and, catching sight of us, he set up his professional whine. And I looked at my friend with the heartiest compassion, for I knew well from Martha, it was common talk, that at this time of day he was certainly and surely penniless. Morn by morn he started forth with pockets lined, and each returning evening found him with never a sou. All this he proceeded to explain at length to the tramp, courteously and even shamefacedly, as one who was in the wrong. And at last the gentleman of the road, realizing the hopelessness of his case, set to and cursed him with gusto, vocabulary, and abandonment. He reviled his eyes, his features, his limbs, his profession, his relatives, and surroundings, and then slouched off, still oozing malice and filth. We watched the party to a turn in the road, where the woman, plainly weary, came to a stop. Her lord, after some conventional expletives demanded of him by his position, relieved her of her bundle, and caused her to hang on his arm with a certain rough kindness of tone, and in action even a dim approach to tenderness, and the dingy dog crept up for one lick at her hand. "'See,' said my friend, bearing somewhat on my shoulder, "'how this strange thing, this love of ours, lives and shines out in the unlikeliest of places.' You have been in the fields in early morning, barren acres all. But only stoop, catch the light thwartwise, and all is a silver network of gossamer. So the fairy filaments of this strange thing underrun and link together the whole world. Yet it is not the old imperious god of the fatal bow, Eros, Anikate Machan, not that, nor even the placid, respectable Storji, but something still unnamed, perhaps more mysterious, more divine. Only one must stoop to see it, old fellow, one must stoop. The dew was falling, the dusk closing, as I trotted briskly homewards down the road. Lonely spaces everywhere, above and around. Only Hesperus hung in the sky, solitary, pure, ineffably far-drawn and remote, yet infinitely heartening somehow in his valorous isolation. End of Section 9 of The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham End of the Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 10 Snowbound. Twelfth night had come and gone, and life next morning seemed a trifle flat and purposeless. But yester even the murmurs were here. They had come striding into the old kitchen 
powdering the red brick floor with snow from their barbaric bedizenments, and stamping and crossing and declaiming till all was whirl and riot and shout. Harold was frankly afraid. Unabashed, he buried himself in the cook's ample bosom. Edward feigned a manly superiority to illusion, and greeted these awful apparitions familiarly as Dick and Harry and Joe. As for me, I was too big to run, too rapt to resist the magic and surprise. Whence came these outlanders, breaking in on us with song and ordered mask, and a terrible clashing of wooden swords? And after these, what strange visitants might we not look for any quiet night, when the chestnuts popped in the ashes, and the old ghost stories drew the awe-stricken circle close? Old Merlin, perhaps, all furred in black sheepskins and a russet gown, with a bow and arrows, and bearing wild geese in his hand, or stately Ogier the Dane, recalled from fairy, asking his way to the land that once had need of him. Or even, on some white night, the Snow Queen herself, with the chime of sleigh bells and the patter of reindeer's feet, with sudden halt at the door flung wide, while aloft the northern lights went shaking attendant spears among the quiet stars. This morning, housebound by the relentless, indefatigable snow, I was feeling the reaction. Edward, on the contrary, being violently stage-struck on this, his first introduction to the real drama, was striding up and down the floor, proclaiming, Here be I, King George the Third, in a strong Berkshire accent. Harold, accustomed as the youngest to lonely antics and to sports that ask no sympathy, was absorbed in clubmen a performance consisting in a measured progress around the room, arm in arm with an imaginary companion of reverend years, with occasional halts at imaginary clubs, where, imaginary steps being leisurely ascended, imaginary papers were glanced at, imaginary scandal was discussed with elderly shakings of the head, and, regrettably to say, imaginary glasses were lifted lipwards. Heaven only knows how this germ of this dreary pastime first found way into his small boyish being. It was his own invention, and he was proportionately proud of it. Meanwhile, Charlotte and I, crouched in the window seat, watched spell-stricken the whirl and eddy and drive of the innumerable snowflakes, wrapping our cheery little world in an uncanny uniform ghastly in line and hue. Charlotte was sadly out of spirits. Having countered Miss Smedley at breakfast, during some argument or other, by an apt quotation from her favorite classic, The Fairy Book, she had been gently but firmly informed that no such things as fairies ever really existed. "'Do you mean to say it's all lies?' asked Charlotte bluntly. Miss Smedley deprecated the use of any such unladylike words in any connection at all. These stories have their own origin, my dear, she explained, in a mistaken anthropomorphism in the interpretation of nature. But though we are now too well informed to fall into similar errors, there are still many beautiful lessons to be learned from these myths. But how can you learn anything, persisted Charlotte, from what doesn't exist? And she left the table defiant, howbeit depressed. Don't you mind her, I said consolingly. How can she know anything about it? Why, she can't even throw a stone properly. Edward says they're all rot, too, replied Charlotte doubtfully. Edward says everything's rot, I explained. Now he thinks he's going into the army. If a thing's in a book, it must be true. So that settles it. Charlotte looked almost reassured. The room was quieter now, for Edward had got the dragon down and was boring holes in him with a purring sound. Harold was ascending the steps of the Athenaeum with a jaunty air, suggestive rather of the junior Carlton. Outside the tall elm tops were hardly to be seen through the feathery storm. The skies are falling, quoted Charlotte softly. I must go and tell the king. The quotation suggested a fairy story, and I offered to read to her, reaching out for the book. But the wee folk were under a cloud, Skeptical hints had embittered the chalice, so I was fain to fetch Arthur. Second favorite was Charlotte for his dame's riding errant, and an easy first with us boys for his spear-splintering crash of tourney and hurdle against hopeless odds. Here again, however, I proved unfortunate. What ill luck made the book open at the sorrowful history of Balin and Balin? And he vanished anon, I read, and so he heard a horn blow as it had been the death of a beast. 
that last said Balin is blowin for me, for I am the prize, and yet am I not dead. Charlotte began to cry. She knew the rest too well. I shut the book in despair. Harold emerged from behind the armchair. He was sucking his thumb, a thing which members of the reform are seldom seen to do, and he stared wide-eyed at his tear-stained sister. Edward put off his histrionics and rushed up to her as the consoler, a new part for him. "'I know a jolly story,' he began. "'Aunt Eliza told it to me. It was when she was somewhere over in that beastly abroad. He had once spent a black month of misery at Dinan, and there was a fellow there who had got two storks, and one stork died. It was the she-stork. "'What did it die of?' put in Harold. And the other stork was quite sorry and moped, and went on and got very miserable. So they looked about and found the duck, and introduced it to the stork. The duck was a drake, but the stork didn't mind, and they loved each other and were as jolly as could be. By and by another duck came along, a real she-duck this time, and when the drake saw her he fell in love, and left the stork, and went and proposed to the duck, for she was very beautiful. But the poor stork who was left... He said nothing at all to anybody, but just pined and pined and pined away till one morning he was found quite dead. But the ducks lived happily ever afterwards. This was Edward's idea of a jolly story. Down again went the corners of poor Charlotte's mouth. Really, Edward's stupid inability to see the real point in anything was too annoying. It was always so. Years before, it being necessary to prepare his youthful mind for a domestic event that might lead to awkward questionings at a time when there was little leisure to invent appropriate answers, it was delicately inquired of him whether he would like to have a little brother or perhaps a little sister. He considered the matter carefully in all its bearings, and finally declared for a Newfoundland pup. Any boy more Clegg at the uptack would have met his parents halfway and eased their burdens. As it was, the matter had to be approached all over again from a fresh standpoint. And now, while Charlotte turned away sniffingly, with a hiccough that told of an overwrought soul, Edward, uncautious, like Sir Isaac's diamond, of the mischief he had done, wheeled round on Harold with a shout. "'I want a live dragon,' he announced. "'You've got to be my dragon.' "'Leave me go, will you?' squealed Harold, struggling stoutly. "'I'm playing at something else. How can I be a dragon and belong to all the clubs?' "'But wouldn't you like to be a nice scaly dragon, all green?' said Edward, trying persuasion. "'With a curly tail and red eyes and breathing real smoke and fire?' Harold wavered an instant. Paul Maul was still strong in him. The next he was groveling on the floor. No saurian ever swung a tail so scaly and so curly as his. Clubland was a thousand years away. With horrific pants, he emitted smokiest smoke and fiercest fire. "'Now I want a princess,' cried Edward, clutching Charlotte ecstatically, "'and you can be the doctor and heal me from the dragon's deadly wound.' Of all professions, I held the sacred art of healing in worst horror and contempt." Cataclysmal memories of purge and draught crowded thick on me, and with Charlotte, who courted no barren honours, I made a break for the door. Edward did likewise, and the hostile forces clashed together on the mat, and for a brief space things were mixed in chaotic and Arthurian. The silvery sound of the luncheon bell restored an instant peace, even in the teeth of clenched antagonisms like ours. The Holy Grail itself, sliding athwart a sunbeam, never so effectually stilled the riot of warring passions into sweet and quiet accord. End of section 10eleven of The Golden Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 11. What They Talked About. Edward was standing ginger beer like a gentleman, 
happening, as the one that had last passed under the dentist's hands, to be the capitalist of the flying hour. As in all well-regulated families, the usual tariff obtained in ours, half a crown a tooth, one shilling only if the molar were a loose one. This, too, unfortunately, in spite of Edward's interested affectation of agony, had been shaky undisguised, but the event was good enough to run to ginger-beer. As financier, however, Edward had claimed exemption from any servile duties of procurement, and had swaggered about the garden while I fetched from the village post-office, and Harold stole a tumbler from the pantry. Our preparations complete, we were sprawling on the lawn. The staidest and most self-respecting of the rabbits had been let loose to grace the feast, and was lopping demurely about the grass, selecting the juiciest plantains, while Selina, as the eldest lady present, was toying in her affected feminine way with the first full tumbler, daintily fishing for bits of broken cork. "'Hurry up, can't you?' growled our host. "'What are you girls always so beastly particular for?' "'Martha says,' explained Harold, thirsty too, but still just, "'that if you swallow a bit of cork it swells and it swells and it swells inside you till you—' "'Oh, bosh!' said Edward, draining the glass with a fine pretense of indifference to consequences, but all the same, as I noticed, dodging the floating cork fragments with skill and judgment. "'Oh, it's all very well to say bosh,' replied Harold, nettled. "'But every one knows it's true but you. Why, when Uncle Thomas was here last, and they got up a bottle of wine for him, he took just one tiny sip out of his glass, and then he said, "Pooh, my goodness, that's corked, and he wouldn't touch it and they had to get a fresh bottle up. The funny part was, though, I looked in his glass afterwards, when it was brought out into the passage, and there wasn't any cork in it at all, so I drank it all off, and it was very good. "'You'd better be careful, young man,' said his elder brother, regarding him severely. "'Do you remember the night when the mummers were here, and they had mulled port, and you went round and emptied all the glasses after they had gone away?' "'Ow, oh, I did feel funny that night,' chuckled Harold. "'Thought the house was coming down and jumped about so, "'and Martha had to carry me up to bed "'cause the stairs was going all waggedy.' "'We gazed searchingly at our graceless junior, "'but it was clear that he viewed the matter "'in the light of a phenomenon rather than of a delinquency. "'A third bottle was by this time circling, "'and Selina, who had evidently waited for it to reach her, "'took a most unfairly long pull, "'and then, jumping up and shaking out her frock, "'announced that she was going for a walk. "'Then she fled like a hare,' for it was the custom of our family to meet with physical coercion any independence of action in individuals. "'She's off with those vicarage girls again,' said Edward, regarding Selina's long black legs twinkling down the path. "'She goes out with them every day now, and as soon as ever they start all their heads go together and they chatter, chatter, chatter the whole blessed time. I can't make out what they find to talk about. They never stop. It's gabble, gabble, gabble right along, like a nest of young rooks.' "'Perhaps they talk about birds' eggs,' I suggested sleepily. The sun was hot, the turf soft, the ginger-beer potent. "'And about ships, and buffaloes, and desert islands, and why rabbits have white tails, and whether they'd sooner have a schooner or a cutter, and what they'll be when they're men. At least, I mean, there's lots of things to talk about if you want to talk.' "'Yes, but they don't talk about those sort of things at all,' persisted Edward. "'How can they? They don't know anything. They can't do anything except play the piano, and nobody would want to talk about that. And they don't care about anything, anything sensible, I mean. So what do they talk about?' "'I asked Martha once,' put in Harold, "'and she said, "'Never you mind. Young ladies has lots of things to talk about that young gentlemen can't understand.' "'I don't believe it,' Edward growled. "'Well, that's what she said, anyway,' rejoined Harold, indifferently. The subject did not seem to him of first-class importance, and it was hindering the circulation of the ginger-beer. We heard the click of the front gate. Through a gap in the hedge we could see the party setting off down the road. Selina was in the middle. A vicarage girl had her by either arm. Their heads were together, as Edward had described— and the clack of their tongues came down the breeze like the busy pipe of starlings on a bright March morning. "'What do they talk about, Charlotte?' I inquired, wishing to pacify Edward. "'You go out with them sometimes.' "'I don't know,' said poor Charlotte, dolefully. "'They make me walk behind, cause they say I'm too little and mustn't hear. And I do want to so,' she added. 
"'When any lady comes to see Aunt Eliza,' said Harold, "'they both talk at once all the time, "'and yet each of them seems to hear what the other one's saying. "'I can't make out how they do it. "'Grown-up people are so clever.' "'The curate's the funniest man,' I remarked. "'He's always saying things that have no sense in them at all, "'and then laughing at them as if they were jokes. "'Yesterday, when they asked him if he'd have some more tea, he said, "'Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more,' "'and then sniggered all over. "'I didn't see anything funny in that. "'And then somebody asked him about his buttonhole, and he said, "'Tis but a little faded flower,' and exploded again. "'I thought it very stupid.' "'Oh, him!' said Edward contemptuously. "'He can't help it, you know. "'It's a sort of way he's got. "'But it's these girls I can't make out. "'If they've anything really sensible to talk about, "'how is it nobody knows what it is? "'And if they haven't, and we know they can't have, naturally, "'why don't they shut up their jaw? "'This old rabbit here, he doesn't want to talk. "'He's got something better to do.' "'And Edward aimed a ginger-beer cork at the unruffled beast, "'who never budged.' "'Oh, but rabbits do talk,' interposed Harold. "'I've watched them often in their hutch. "'They put their heads together, and their noses go up and down, "'just like Selina's and the vicarage girls. "'Only, of course, I can't hear what they're saying.' "'Well, if they do,' said Edward, unwillingly, "'I'll bet they don't talk such rot as those girls do.' "'Which was ungenerous, as well as unfair, "'for it had not yet transpired, nor has it to this day, "'what Selina and her friends talked about.' End of section 11, read by Kara Schallenberg on August 27, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 12 of The Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham Chapter 12 The Argonauts The advent of strangers, of whatever sort, into our circle had always been a matter of grave dubiety and suspicion. Indeed, it was generally a signal for retreat into caves and fastnesses of the earth, into unthreaded copses or remote outlying cowsheds, whence we were only to be extricated by wily nursemaids, rendered familiar by experience with our secret runs and refuges. It was not surprising, therefore, that the heroes of classic legend, when first we made their acquaintance, failed to win our entire sympathy at once. Confidence, says somebody, is a plant of slow growth and these stately dark-haired demigods, with names hard to master and strange accoutrements, had to win a citadel already strongly garrisoned with a more familiar soldiery. Their chill foreign goddesses had no such direct appeal for us as the mocking malicious fairies and witches of the north. We missed the pleasant alliance of the animal, the fox who spread the bushiest of tales to convey us to the enchanted castle, the frog in the well, the raven who croaked advice from the tree, and, to Harold especially, it seemed entirely wrong that the hero should ever be other than the youngest brother of three. This belief, indeed, in the special fortune that ever awaited the youngest brother, as such, the borough English of fairy, had been of baleful effect on Harold, producing a certain self-conceit and perkiness that called for physical correction. But even in our admonishment we were on his side, and as we distrustfully eyed these new arrivals, old Saturn himself seemed something of a parvenu. Even strangers, however, if they be good fellows at heart, may develop into sworn comrades, and these gay swordsmen, after all, were of the right stuff. Perseus, with his cap of darkness and his wonderful sandals, was not long in winging his way to our hearts. Apollo knocked at Admetus' gate in something of the right fairy fashion. Psyche brought with her an orthodox palace of magic, as well as helpful birds and friendly ants. Ulysses, with his captivating shifts and strategies, broke down the final barrier, 
and henceforth the band was adopted and admitted into our Freemasonry. I had been engaged in chasing Farmer Larkin's calves, his special pride, round the field, just to show the man we hadn't forgotten him, and was returning through the kitchen garden with a conscience at peace with all men, when I happened upon Edward grubbing for worms in the dung-heap. Edward put his worms into his hat, and we strolled along together, discussing high matters of state. As we reached the tool-shed, strange noises arrested our steps. Looking in, we perceived Harold, alone, rapt, absorbed, immersed in the special game of the moment. He was squatting in an old pig-trough that had been brought in to be tinkered, and as he rhapsodized, anon he waved a shovel over his head, anon dug it into the ground with the action of those who would urge Canadian canoes. Edward strode in upon him. "'What rot are you playing at now?' he demanded sternly. Harold flushed up, but stuck to his pig-trough like a man. "'I'm Jason,' he replied defiantly, "'and this is the Argo. The other fellows are here, too, only you can't see them. And we're just going through the Hellespont, so don't you come bothering.' And once more he plied the wine-dark sea. Edward kicked the pig-trough contemptuously. "'Pretty sort of Argo you've got,' said he. Harold began to get annoyed. "'I can't help it,' he replied. "'It's the best sort of Argo I can manage, and it's all right if you only pretend enough. But you never could pretend one bit.' Edward reflected. "'Look here,' he said presently. "'Why shouldn't we get hold of Farmer Larkin's boat, and go right away up the river in a real Argo, and look for Medea and the Golden Fleece and everything? And I'll tell you what, I don't mind your being Jason, as you thought of it first. Harold tumbled out of the trough in the excess of his emotion. "'But we aren't allowed to go on the water by ourselves,' he cried. "'No,' said Edward, with fine scorn, "'we aren't allowed, and Jason wasn't allowed either, I dare say. But he went.' Harold's protest had been merely conventional. He only wanted to be convinced by sound argument. The next question was, how about the girls? Selina was distinctly handy in a boat. The difficulty about her was that if she disapproved of the expedition, and, morally considered, it was not exactly a pilgrim's progress, she might go and tell she having just reached that disagreeable age when one begins to develop a conscience. Charlotte, for her part, had a habit of daydreams, and was as likely as not to fall overboard in one of her rapt musings. To be sure, she would dissolve in tears when she found herself left out, but even that was better than a watery tomb. In fine, the public voice, and rightly perhaps, was against the admission of the skirted animal spite the precedent of Atalanta, who was one of the original crew. "'And now,' said Edward, "'who's to ask Farmer Larkin? I can't. Last time I saw him he said when he caught me again he'd smack my head. You'll have to.' I hesitated for good reasons. "'You know these precious calves of his?' I began. Edward understood at once. "'All right,' he said then we won't ask him at all. It doesn't much matter. He'll only be annoyed, and that would be a pity. Now, let's set off. We made our way down to the stream, and captured the farmer's boat without let or hindrance, the enemy being engaged in the hayfields. This river, so-called, could never be discovered by us in any atlas. Indeed, our Argo could hardly turn in it without risk of shipwreck. But to us it was... Orinoco, and the cities of the world dotted its shores. We put the Argo's head upstream, since that led away from the Larkin province. Harold was faithfully permitted to be Jason, and we shared the rest of the heroes among us. Then, launching forth from Thessaly, we threaded the Hellespont with shouts, breathlessly dodged the clashing rocks, and coasted under the lee of the siren haunted isles. Lemnos was fringed with meadow-sweet, Dog-roses dotted the Mycian shore, 
and the cheery call of the haymaking folk sounded along the coast of Thrace. After some hour or two's seafaring, the prow of the Argo embedded itself in the mud of a landing-place, plashy with the tread of cows, and giving on to a lane which led towards the smoke of human habitations. Edward jumped ashore, alert for exploration, and strode off without waiting to see if we followed. But I lingered behind, having caught sight of a moss-grown water-gate hard by, leading into a garden that from the brooding quiet lapping it round appeared to portend magical possibilities. Indeed, the very air within seemed stiller as we circumspectly passed through the gate, and Harold hung back shamefaced, as if we were crossing the threshold of some private chamber, and ghosts of old days were hustling past us. Flowers there were, everywhere, but they drooped and sprawled in an overgrowth hinting at indifference. The scent of heliotrope possessed the place, as if actually hung in solid festoons from tall, untrimmed hedge to hedge. No basket shares, shawls, or novels dotted the lawn with colour and on the garden front of the house behind the blinds were mostly drawn. A grey old sundial dominated the central sward, and we moved towards it instinctively, as the most human thing visible. An antique motto ran around it, and with eyes and fingers we struggled at the decipherment. Time? Trieth? Troth? spelled out Harold at last. I wonder what that means. I could not enlighten him, nor meet his further questions as to the inner mechanisms of the thing, and where you wound it up. I had seen these instruments before, of course, but had never fully understood their manner of working. We were still puzzling our heads over the contrivance, when I became aware that Medea herself was moving down the path from the house, dark-haired, supple, of a figure lightly poised and swayed, but pale and listless. I knew her at once, and having come out to find her, naturally felt no surprise at all. But Harold, who was trying to climb on the top of the sundial, having a cat-like fondness for the summit of things, started and fell prone, barking his shin and filling the pleasance with lamentation. Medea skimmed the ground swallow-like, and in a moment was on her knees comforting him, wiping the dirt out of his chin with her own dainty handkerchief and vocal with soft murmur of consolation. "'You needn't take on and so about him,' I observed politely. "'He'll cry for just one minute, and then he'll be all right.' My estimate was justified. At the end of his regulation time Harold stopped crying suddenly, like a clock that has struck its hour, and with a serene and cheerful countenance wriggled out of Medea's embrace, and ran for a stone to throw at an intrusive blackbird. "'Oh, you boys!' cried Medea, throwing wide her arms with abandonment. "'Where have you dropped from? How dirty you are! I've been shut up here for a thousand years, and all that time I've never seen anyone under a hundred and fifty. Let's play at something at once!' "'Rounders is a good game,' I suggested. "'Girls can play at rounders, and we could serve up to the sundial here.' but you want a bat and a ball and some more people." She struck her hands together tragically. "'I haven't a bat,' she cried, "'or a ball, or more people, or anything sensible whatever. Never mind. Let's play at hide-and-seek in the kitchen garden, and we'll race there, up to that walnut-tree. I haven't run for a century.' She was so easy a victor. Nevertheless, that I began to doubt, as I panted behind, whether she had not exaggerated her age by a year or two. She flung herself into hide-and-seek with all the gusto and abandonment of the true artist, and as she flitted away and reappeared, flushed and laughing divinely, the pale witch-maiden seemed to fall away from her, and she moved rather as that other girl I had read about, snatched from fields of daffodil to reign in shadow below yet permitted once again to visit earth and light and the frank caressing air. Tired at last, we strolled back to the old sundial, and Harold, who never relinquished a problem unsolved,
began afresh, rubbing his finger along the faint incisions. Time trieth troth. Please, I want to know what that means. Medea's face drooped low over the sundial, till it was almost hidden in her fingers. That's what I'm here for, she said presently, in quite a changed low voice. They shut me up here. They think I'll forget. But I never will. Never, never. And he, too. But I don't know. It is so long. I don't know. Her face was quite hidden now. There was silence again in the old garden. I felt clumsily helpless and awkward. Beyond a vague idea of kicking Harold, nothing remedial seemed to suggest itself. None of us had noticed the approach of another she-creature, one of the angular and rigid class. How different from our dear comrade! The years Medea had claimed might well have belonged to her. She wore mittens, too, a trick I detested in woman. "'Lucy!' she said sharply, in a tone with aunt writ large over it, and Medea started up guiltily. "'You've been crying,' said the newcomer, grimly regarding her through spectacles. "'And pray who are these exceedingly dirty little boys?' "'Friends of mine, aunt,' said Medea, promptly, with forced cheerfulness. Uh, "'I've known them a long time. I asked them to come.' The aunt sniffed suspiciously. "'You must come indoors, dear,' she said, "'and lie down. The sun will give you a headache, and you little boys had better run away home to your tea. Remember, you should not come to pay visits without your nursemaid.' Harold had been tugging nervously at my jacket for some time, and I only waited till Medea turned and kissed a white hand to us as she was led away. Then I ran. We gained the boat in safety, and— "'What an old dragon!' said Harold. "'Wasn't she a beast?' I replied. "'Fancy the sun giving any one a headache. And Medea was a real brick. Couldn't we marry her off?' "'We could if Edward was here.' said Harold confidently. The question was, what had become of that defaulting hero? We were not left long in doubt. First there came down the lane the shrill and wrathful clamour of a female tongue, then Edward, running his best, and then an excited woman hard on his heel. Edward tumbled into the bottom of the boat, gasping, "'Shove her off!' And shove her off we did, mightily, while the dame abused us from the bank in the self-same accents in which Alfred hurled defiance at the marauding Dane. "'That was just like a bit out of Westward Ho,' I remarked approvingly, as we sculled down the stream. "'But what had you been doing to her?' (laughs) "'Hadn't been doing anything,' panted Edward, still breathless. "'I went up into the village and explored, and it was a very nice one.' and the people were very polite, and there was a blacksmith's forge there, and they were shoeing horses, and the hoofs fizzled and smoked, and smelt so jolly. I stayed there quite a long time. Then I got thirsty, so I asked that old woman for some water, and while she was getting it her cat came out of the cottage, and looked at me in a nasty sort of way, and said something I didn't like. So I went up to it just to to teach it manners and somehow or other next minute it was up an apple-tree, spitting, and I was running down the lane with that old thing after me. Edward was so full of his personal injuries that there was no interesting him in Medea at all. Moreover, the evening was closing in, and it was evident that this cutting-out expedition must be kept for another day. As we neared home it gradually occurred to us that perhaps the greatest danger was yet to come for the farmer must have missed his boat ere now, and would probably be lying in wait for us near the landing-place. There was no other spot admitting of debarkation on the home side. If we got out on the other, and made for the bridge, we should certainly be seen and cut off. Then it was that I blessed my stars that our elder brother was with us that day. He might be little good at pretending, but in grappling with the stern facts of life he had no equal. In joining silence, he waited till we were but a little way from the fated landing-place, and then brought us into the opposite bank. We scrambled out noiselessly, and, the gathering darkness favouring us, crouched behind a willow, while Edward pushed off the empty boat with his foot. 
the old Argo, borne down by the gentle current, slid and grazed along the rushy bank, and when she came opposite the suspected ambush, a stream of imprecation told us that our precaution had not been wasted. We wondered, as we listened, where Farmer Larkin, who was bucolically bred and reared, had acquired such range and wealth of vocabulary. Fully realizing at last that his boat was derelict, abandoned, at the mercy of wind and wave, as well as out of his reach, he strode away to the bridge, about a quarter of a mile further down, and as soon as we heard his boots clumping on the planks, we nipped out, recovered the craft, pulled across, and made the faithful vessel fast to her proper moorings. Edward was anxious to wait and exchange courtesies and compliments with the disappointed farmer, when he should confront us on the opposite bank, but wiser counsels prevailed. It was possible that the piracy was not yet laid at our particular door. Ulysses, I reminded him, had reason to regret a similar act of bravado, and, were he here, would certainly advise a timely retreat. Edward held but a low opinion of me as a counsellor, but he had a very solid respect for Ulysses. End of chapter.